And everybody said, yeah. I welcome you to our training session once again in Jesus' name. Yeah. And remember that our Tuesday meeting is to develop leaders, preachers, and those who are going to do the work of God effectively. It's not like, you know, we're preaching. Yes, there's preaching. It's not just teaching. Training and development are involved. And I pray that every one of us will open up and the Lord will impact every life in Jesus' name. As I've been saying over and over, I pray this will become a reality that will never be the same again in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes you say that and say that, and we just take that for granted. But in reality today, I will never be the same again. God will confirm it for every one of us in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We bless your name for our leaders, for our pastors, for our overseers, and for all the people who are involved in every area of the world. We're asking, O oh Lord, develop your people in Jesus' name. And this work will prosper in our hands. And all the programs we have ahead of us in every group and every district and every region, every state and every country, Lord, we pray they will succeed in Jesus' name. Multitudes will come into the kingdom and many disciples will be developed and raised up to uh, carry on the work in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We're coming to 2 Timothy chapter 4. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're reading from verses 1 through to 5. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heave to themselves teachers having itching ears, and it shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. I pray that these words will be translated to every heart in Jesus' name. Look at verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God. Tonight we are looking at the message, the divine charge for all ministers of Christ. The divine charge for all ministers of Christ. The Christian ministry is a solemn responsibility. All ministers of Christ in whatever area of ministry have a divine charge, a serious charge, a solemn charge, a charge that is given before the Most High God, a charge that is given before the Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to judge all acts, all actions, and all activities before the holy angels, the heavenly host, and the heavenly witnesses. And it says, it's a charge. And Paul the Apostle says, I charge you. I charge you, Timothy, and through that, he crosses over to us and is giving us a charge. Look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 5, verse 21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This must be mightily important that he had said it in uh, the first epistle and is coming to the second epistle and is using the same word to charge. I command you. I charge you. I put this upon you because this is not just me. It's before God. It's before the Lord Jesus Christ. And here it says, Before the elect angels, that thou observe these things without pref preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. As you see then, that he has given us the charge. Before God, before Christ, before the angels, God is watching every minister. God is watching every preacher. God is watching every worker. Not only that, Christ is watching. 
Not only that, the angels of God are watching. What are they watching? They're watching how we carry out the divine charge. Are we doing it faithfully? Are we doing it fervently? Are we doing it fearlessly? Are we doing it faultlessly? Are we doing it firmly? Are we doing it freely? Are we doing it fairly? The Lord is watching. On the other hand, is watching if we're doing it feebly, with feeble efforts. We're doing it faintly, as if we're almost fainting on the job. We're doing it fleshly, as if we only bring a fleshly strength and fleshly wisdom, human wisdom, into it. Or we're doing it falsely. We're not faithful to the call. And we're not rigid and firm on what the Lord has called us to do. And we're doing it fraudulently. It's like there's some people are practicing fraud as they say they are ministering. Maybe they are not here. Maybe in many circles, in many circles outside there, they do it fraudulently. Other people do it flippantly, frivolously. It's like... You know, they're just flippant about it. There is no seriousness. They do not see this as a charge. Other people do it forgetfully. It's like, I forgot. You have to do this, I forgot. Pick up that, I forgot. But God is watching. The angels are watching. Even sinners in the world are watching us. And the saints are watching. The divine church for all ministers of Christ. And I pray that as God has given us this work to do, we'll do it with all our hearts, all our strength, and all the intelligence, everything the Lord has given us will bring to the work in Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ. A commissioner. Commissioned by Christ, a worker, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, appointed by God. A person appointed, anointed, approved of God, and is a minister of Christ. And it says, as stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Let's come back to Second Timothy chapter 4. The divine charge... For all ministers of Christ. Divine charge for you. Any minister of Christ there? What are they? You are one of them? A divine charge is coming to you. You'll fulfill it. This work will prosper in your hand. Every kind of a weakness will vanish away in Jesus' name. We're looking at three things. Number one, in this message, the charge before the faithful, impartial judge. The charge before the faithful and impartial judge. Number two, the certainty of the final, imminent judgment. The certainty of the final, imminent judgment. Number three, the challenge. Of fully following the incorruptible just one. Jesus is the just one. He's incorruptible. He's immutable. He's unchangeable. And if he were to come to do the work physically today, he'll do it faithfully. And there will be no corruption in the work. And he has called us that we'll follow after him the challenge of fully following the incorruptible just one. Number one. Tell me number one. The church before the faithful impartial judge. We're coming to Second Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. And I'm reading here from verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing 
and at his kingdom. Preach the word. That's the charge. Preach the word. We're coming to First Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 18. The charge he gives us, the charge he gives you before the faithful and impartial judge. In First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. He wanted Timothy to always have the idea this is not uh, like a hobby. This is not like a pastime. This is not like I chose this and if I don't want it again, I'll drop it. It says, it's a charge. This charge I commit unto thee, Timothy, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Timothy, as you face the challenge of ministry, sometimes it looks like a warfare. And this is not something you'll say. I, I, say, I don't think I can continue this one. This one is too tough. The fire is too hot. And the situation is too rough. I cannot continue. No, it's a charge. It's like charge given to a soldier. It's like the charge given to a people before the magistrates and before the jury. And it is not something you can back out from and say, can I continue or not? Of course you will continue. Yeah. What's the charge here? Look at verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience. They want to knock it out of your hand. Faith. They'll want to knock it out of your message, faith. They'll want to knock it out of your hold, your firm hold. It says you have a charge to hold that faith and hold the good conscience which some having put away concerning faith have made a shipwreck. You will not make a shipwreck. We're looking at uh, chapter 5, 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 19. From verse 19 it says... Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. In verse 20, them that sin, rebuke before all, that others also may fear. Look at that. Timothy, can you do this? I'm not sure I can do that. I'm of a timid personality. I'm of a timid mind. If I look at people and they look at me and they fix their gaze on me, it makes me to lose my balance. I cannot collect myself. I cannot coordinate myself. Once they look at me, especially if they are furious, if they are kind of fierce, and they look at me like this, I drop my head because I cannot bear looking at people like that. And then for me now to say, I'm going to rebuke anybody. In fact, I cannot even rebuke my own children. I cannot rebuke those who are, you know, junior to me at the place of work and have to talk about those elderly people. And then out of the two, three uh, witnesses who found them guilty of going into whatever evil. But it says, verse 20, I'm looking at that again. Them that sin, tell me out loud, rebuke before all, that others also may fear. Look at verse 21. I charge thee. It's a charge. It's not something you'll say. My nature doesn't accept that. My upbringing doesn't uh, go in line with that. It's part of the ministry for the minister of Christ. And it says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another doing, uh, tell me, I thought you will say that aloud. <laughs> Doing nothing by partiality. You will not be partial. Yeah. We're looking at chapter 6 of that same 1 Timothy. And I'm reading from verse 13. In verse 13 it says, look at this again. 
Looks like Paul wanted to tell Timothy, you know, Timothy, this is not like father-son relationship. Here we are not being sentimental. Here is not just, uh, you know, affection. I'm talking to you the authority of an apostle and the authority of the one that has heard from God. And I'm giving you this charge, not privately, as if uh, there's no witness. It says in verse 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God. It's always saying, the charge is not a private thing it's not just between you and I so that if you fail I can excuse you I understand your nature I understand your timidity I understand your bringing it says no I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickness all things and before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witness a good profession that thou keep this commandment without sport there's no excuse for imperfection. There's no excuse for failure that you keep this without spot or rebukeable until the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You will do it. I said you will do it. And then look at verse 17. Timothy, see the charge I've given you. Now do you know that you, Timothy, you're also to charge other people? Yes, I can go to the children's section and charge them. I say, children, anytime the preaching is going on, keep quiet. I can do that in the children's section. I can manage to the youth section. And then I tell the young people, I say, young people, you know what? I'm a father. And I have a children like you. And they listen to me. So I charge you, be obedient to the word of God. He says, I'm not talking about going to the youth or going to the children. Look at verse 17. Verse 17. Everybody, one, two, three, go. Ah, that's tough. That's difficult. Timothy, you know what? You speak with authority. You speak with assurance. And if you want the rich to be saved, you look at them and give them the word of salvation. If you want them to get to heaven, you cannot be apologetic. Well, I think, I feel, I shouldn't say this. I'm not qualified. Who am I to tell you this? But is it not all right if you repented? Don't you think it would be a good thing? Look at Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Look at him bleeding. And look at the crown of thorns. And look at the nail on his son. Don't you think, at least even if he's in sympathy, we come to him and say, because of what you have suffered, then I repent and do him a favor. And don't allow him to feel so sorry that he died. And nobody's believing. Say, so you cannot talk like that. You will not talk like that. You talk to the young, you talk to the old, you talk to the rich, you talk to the poor, and you charge them. Because it's the word of God. You are telling them, you are bringing to them the word coming from the throne of God. And it says in verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, not trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us all things to Enjoy. Come to verse 20. In verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some are professing have aired concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. And everybody said, now Come back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1, verse 2. The charge. The charge is to compel him to do something. Commission him to do something. Command him to do something. I charge thee therefore before God. What am I to do in the charge? Verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season. And out of season. Rainy season. Dry season. Preach the word. You know sir. Rainy season, I feel so cold, I don't think I can come out of the house. Dry season, I feel so hot, I'm sweating all the time. I need to take my bath every other hour. That is, an hour now, I take my bath, I'm sweating again, I have to take my bath again. I'm sweating, I have to take my bath again. So what can I do? How can I go out to the field? Rainy season, dry season, he said, in season and out of season. 
when you feel all right, when you don't feel all right. When it's convenient, when it's not convenient, it says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. That is the charge. God will give you grace. God will give every one of us grace. We will do the work in Jesus' name. Preach the word. Look at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What's included in that gospel that we are to preach? In Luke chapter 24, verse 47. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. We preach the whole gospel. We preach the whole word, salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, marriage, family, everything the word of God reveals, preach the word. And we preach it out of season and in season, we're instant, we're fervent, and we're committed, and we're doing it, and nothing will beat us back in Jesus' name. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, thank God, the early apostles did it, and now it's your time. Now it's my time, now it's our time, we're going to do it. And we're going to do it faithfully. We're going to do it fruitfully. This work will prosper in your hand. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 19. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 19. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when they had that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. They entered into the temple. What time of the day? I said, what time of the day? Can you have early morning preaching? I can't hear my people. Can you go to the church building and, and get people together early morning, 5 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30 before they go to work? You're doing evangelism already. You're doing discipleship already. It can be done. It will be done. They did it in the Acts of the Apostles. They did it a limit, uh, preaching the gospel and preaching the word to only about two hours in the evening, only one day or two days in the week. They did it every time. Looks like there are people here who are ready to do it every time. See how they did it and see how you are going to do it. We're looking at chapter 5 and verse 42. Chapter 5, verse 42. You're going to give me the first few words, number two, uh, 1, 2, 3, go 42. And daily in the temple and in every house. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. They accepted the commission. The church is clear. The church is concise. And the church is compelling like the student's church like the soldier's church, like the servant's church, it demands an unwavering commitment. The final evaluation will not examine how good the students are in extra moral, extracurricular activities. You know, we send our children to school, we charge them, I'm sending you to school, not for girlfriend, boyfriend, purpose. I'm sending you to school. I'm sending you there and I'm spending this amount of money for you to come back and give and show me a good certificate that is worth what we're putting on education. That's the charge you give them. And when they go there, they're not for extracurricular activities. I'm in this society. I'm in this club. I'm into this game. I'm into that. Maybe they can do that uh, for a little time because they all walk and uh, no play makes Jack a dull boy. But all the same, they're going to concentrate on the charge. We're giving them the same thing. You know? The Lord has given us a charge. And we're not concentrating on extracurricular activities. I'm doing this. I'm doing this games in the world think about that and all the other things that take people's time and they cannot do the thing we're trying to do all that will go 
especially now the last days have come and it's the last time and the time of examination and the time of evaluation is about to come the church will be the central consideration in the presence of the great assembly of angels and men on the final day of judgment on the final day of judgment all the extracurricular activities where you know involved with i do this i do this i do that that will not come into the evaluation on the final day of judgment what will come into consideration is this is the charge you are given what did you do about it was it central were you focused were you purposed? Were you doing it as if this is the only one thing to do? I pray that from today, every one of us will wake up. I come to point number two now, and it's the certainty of the final imminent judgment. The certainty of the final judgment. And that judgment is imminent. It's not something that is still far away. For every individual, even before the rapture happens, we've been finding people in our midst. You know, they finish their work and they've gone to their rewards. They never knew. They never knew. About uh, six months ago, no, they never knew that they were going to go to the great million. But one by one, one by one, we're going. And when it comes to your time, I pray you would have finished. You have, so you have a kind of summarized everything and you'll be able to say like Paul the Apostle, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. It will happen, so happen in your case in Jesus name. But you see there's going to be a reckoning day. The certainty of the final imminent judgment. Let's come back to Second Timothy chapter 4 and we're looking at verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick that's the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Paul the apostle said Timothy judgment day is coming and it is certain judgment day is around the corner and it is certain Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment everybody knows the day of death you may not know the exact day but you know it's certain if Jesus tarries you know that death is appointed unto men and it's appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment death is certain and judgment is certain Romans chapter 2 Romans chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 5 Romans chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 5 in Romans chapter 2 verse 5 here the word of God tells us of the certainty of judgment but after the hardness and the impenitent heart treacherous up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God judgment of God our students uh, from experience or from observation when I was a teacher students did not like and I think they don't still like thinking about exam day the day of examination is the reckoning day is the day when we're going to learn you know sitting on that desk and listening to all these lectures and lessons and then writing all those notes and all the you know the coursework that you're doing whether you are really following or not they don't like to think about that final day but the final day always comes the judgment day always comes and for us too those of us who are working for the Lord we might not be thinking of the final day but it will come it's the judgment day when the Lord will evaluate everything that we have done look at verse 6 there it says so we render to every man according to his deeds I want you to underline verse 16 verse 16 in the day when God shall judge, tell me. I can't hear you. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. You know, maybe we cannot tell. Even for those who are in the house here today, I cannot tell. Those who are floppy. Those who are careless. Those who are nonchalant. Those who are idle. Those who are not doing the work, those who are holding the title, 
but they are not actually going through the task. Those who have the position and those who have the authority, but really they are not doing anything and they are standing in front there and the people that are eager to walk are queuing up and lining up behind them. I cannot tell because we're leaders, we're ministers, but it says the Lord will judge the secrets of men. We cannot tell, I cannot tell from my faces, those who are preaching the sound doctrine, those who are firm, those who are clear, those who are compelling, those who are convincing, and those who are convicting, and those who are leading sinners to Christ, we cannot tell, but the secrets, the Lord will judge everything. It says, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the way we do the work and the way we carry ourselves and the way we prepare, we prepare the messages, we prepare the Sunday scripture, we prepare the teaching, we prepare the preaching, we prepare the Thursday revival, we prepare everything that we're doing. I cannot tell a secret to you between you and God, but the secrets will be made clear on the final day of judgment, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Verse 14. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14. For God shall judge every work. For it says, For God shall bring every work into judgment. Every work into judgment with every secret thing. Faithful, a secret, we don't know, but God will bring it out. Unfaithful, we don't know, but God will bring it out. Flippant, serious. And serious minded, the Lord will bring it steadfast in the work of God, or we're sluggish, the Lord will bring it out because it says, For God shall bring how many kinds of work? Every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or it be evil. At this time now, when we can make correction, at this time now, when we can rise up and say, Lord, I don't think I've been doing the work the way I need to do it, but now I rise up and I'm going to give myself to it completely. The Lord will forgive the past. And then a new person will come in the world. And on the judgment day, he'll give you a well done in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 9, Psalm 9, reading from verses 7 and 8. The certainty of the final judgment, the imminent judgment. In Psalm 9, verses 7 and 8, But the Lord shall, but the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. You see that? He has prepared his throne for judgment. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Well, what about the people that forget God? They, they are working for God, but they forget God. God, they are not thinking of God. They are not considering God. They are not saying, does God appreciate this? Does God approve of this? Is this the way God wants this done? Will this please God? Will this not please God? No, they don't consider that. They just walk. I'm a walker. Do you think of God? It's evaluation. It's approval. And it's well done to hear the final. No, I've forgotten about that. Do you remember the principle that God himself had laid down? I've forgotten about that. And do you remember the purpose he has laid down in doing the work? I've forgotten about that. Look at verse 17. The wicked shall be turned where? Tell me out loud. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that... What? All the nations that forget God. What does that mean? It means that uh, when some of them, uh, they do whatever they are doing, they plant their crops, but they forget God. They reap their crops, they forget God. They take it to the market, they forget God. They sell in the market, they forget God. They do business, but they forget God. And they try to do whatever good they think they can do, and they forget God. And there are some religious people like that. Religious people, they are religious, but they forget God. And they read their Bible, but they forget God. They belong to a denomination, they forget God. They say they are ministers, but they don't bring God into the ministry. No. 
they can talk about God, they can talk about anything, whatever they like they say, whatever they don't like they don't say, whatever they want to teach they teach, whatever they don't appreciate they don't teach, they don't think about God, they forget God and it says all the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God, I pray that in your ministry you will not forget God. In your preaching, you'll not forget God. You have the mind that God is watching, that Christ is watching, that the angels are watching, that the saints and the sinners are watching, and that on the final day will appear before the Almighty God and before that great assembly up on high on the great day of judgment, and is going to reveal to everyone the value of the work we have done. We're looking at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse. 47 and verse 48. Luke chapter 12. We're reading from verse 47. In verse 47, here the Lord himself a talking, saying, And a servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, it says, Neither did according to his will shall be beaten. How will he be beaten? I said, How will he be beaten? You know, as I read that verse, I can, I can only think of deeper life people that hear the word of God. And we almost read the whole Bible. We go from Genesis to Exodus to the Psalms and to Job and to Matthew to Mark. And we go to the epistles and we come to Revelation in one message. And we know the will of God. We know the mind of God. And we know what he wants us to do. And he says, the servants that knows his master's will. And he does it not shall be beat him. And he says, with many stripes. I can think of a people who attend all this training, who attend all this development uh, teachings, and then everything we have heard, we have even reached them down, and then we have even prayed, and we have made covenant to the Lord, I will do this, I will do this, and then after one day we have forgotten, and it's like we didn't come to any development uh, study at all, and it says, the servant that knows his master's will, that is to evangelize, the, master, the person that knows his master's will is to teach the word of God, is to stand by sound doctrine. The one that knows the charge, the charge before God and the charge before Christ and yet will not do the will of God it says shall be beaten up with many stripes. Then it says in verse 48 you know some people say well I'm not in deeper life and uh, you know thank God I don't hear all those things so I will not be guilty. You think so verse 48 but he that knew not I didn't know about sanctification, so I wasn't sanctified. He that knew not, I didn't know about holiness. Our preachers never talked about holiness. Our Bible school never spoke about holiness. I didn't know about that. He that knew not, I didn't know about one man, one wife. Uh, they just told us, marry, marry. And I picked up the first one, and you know, uh, things were not going on well. I picked up another one, and nobody told me anything. He that knew not, they don't know the doctrines of the Bible. They don't know the teaching of the Bible. But he that knew not and committed things worthy and commit things worthy of stripes shall be excused. What will happen? Shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whom much is given, of who of him shall much be required, and unto whom men have committed much of him, they shall ask the more. I pray that as we have known, we're going to be faithful to what we know in Jesus' name. And this truth of the word of God will abide and remain with us in Jesus' name. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. 17, judgment is certain, judgment is imminent, and the judgment day is around the corner. It says in uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 31, in verse 31, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. He said, assurance Show us Jesus rose from the dead. And that assurance alone tells you that judgment day is coming. That's what that verse is emphasizing because it's appointed a day. 
is the which will judge the world in righteousness and is going to judge the world by that man, by Jesus Christ, whom he has ordained because he has given assurance unto all men that he rose from the dead and because of that, that judgment is coming. And the judgment will start from the house of God. We're looking at uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. How faithful have we been there will be judgment? How faithful have we been there will be judgment? What do we carry out in our private houses uh, between us and our members of our family? Is it according to the word of God there will be judgment? What do we do in our offices behind the closed doors and behind the curtain there will be judgment? And the judgment will start from the people that have been hearing the word of God. If they have been obedient or not been obedient. First Peter chapter 4 verse 17. For the time is come. That judgment must begin at the house of God. The time will come that judgment will begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at, at who? Tell me out loud. At us, the speaker, the apostle. At us, the apostles. At us, the preachers. At us, the pastors. If the judgment begins at us, it says, what shall the end of them be? That would be not the gospel. Look at verse 18. If the righteous scarcely be saved, the people who are righteous, the people who are saved, the people who are cleansed, the people who are walking right, and the people who are holy, and the people who are careful about their lives, if the people who are meticulous about, I can't go that way, I can't touch that, I can't take that, I can't do that, because I want to get to heaven, if those people, if the righteous are scarcely saved, be scarcely saved, then it says, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? The one that lives carelessly, I don't care what they say, I don't care what they preach, I don't care what you read in the Bible. I'm just going to live my life the way I think I want to live my life. The judgment day will come and they will be surprised because everything they have heard will come and talk against them and witness against them and walk against them. I pray that will not be you. How far is the judgment? Let's look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 9. Some people think, you know, it's, it's still not uh, very near. It's still far away. No, it's imminent. Look at this in chapter 5 and verse 9. It says, Grudge not against another brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, behold, tell me everybody, behold. One, two, three, go, behold. In unison, everybody, behold. Very near. The judge standeth at the door. And that's why we're insisting on the word of God. That's why we're passionate about the word of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Hold on for a moment. There are people that they want to escape the real word of God here. And then they go into Greek and they say, well, this is talking about, you know, the Bema seat, all our sins and all our, whatever it is we've done has been judged on Christ. So we're not going to face judgment anymore. We're now free. And we can do whatever we want now because Calvary has settled it all. And when it says we shall all appear at the judgment seat of Christ, they say, according to the Greek and according to the whatever language, they say, it's not talking about real, real judgment. It's talking about, you know, the evolution of your work, whether you get reward or you don't get reward. Read everything, my brother. Read everything, my sister. You know, those books, it's like when we send our children to school. And then our children go to the normal class and the teacher is teaching them about on the curriculum, on the real subject. The things they will go to be examined on. And then after class, they go to pick a particular book. And that book is just to, you know, is to make them, uh, you know, laugh and happy and is to make them relax is to while away the time it's just humorous and it's not telling them the real truth and our children they take to those comics and they take to all those things and the real subject they push aside they will fail i pray your own child will not fail 
But you know, if they are going to pass their exam, you concentrate on the real textbook. All the other things that are just seen on the fringe, you throw away. Look at this now. Read it properly. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone, how many people? shall receive the judgment done in his body according to that which he has done whether it be tell me good or bad look at verse 11 knowing therefore the terror of the lord you see that they're connected together it's not talking about you know it, it, you just go there there's no terror there's no pain there's no suffering there's no consequence whatever you have done forget about that they say god does not see your sin they say if peter tells a lie god does not see that he only sees christ if paul the apostle compromising they say god does not see that he only sees you know christ in them they say if uh, you know a child of god is saved soul they say if he goes to commit adultery god does not see the adultery no he only sees jesus that's a lie everybody tell me that's a lie that's a lie god sees everything it's a pure eyes that will behold iniquity and so paul the apostle says knowing therefore the terror of the lord will persuade men but we are made manifest unto god and i trust also are made manifest in your consciences and i pray that your life will be according to this word in jesus name oh, what's the consequence what are we to do about this if the judgment is clear if the judgment day is coming if the judgment day is imminent what are we to do first corinthians chapter 11 i'm reading from the start of one first corinthians chapter 11 and we're reading from the start of one it says in the start of one for if we will judge ourselves we should not be judged as we know that judgment day is coming am i doing the work of god i come to prayer today and i say lord i'm so sorry about this the way i've been doing the work of God, if I'm going to teach uh, maybe on Sunday, I don't uh, prepare, or if I'm going to handle Sunday scripture, I don't prepare, or if I'm going to handle prayer meeting, I don't prepare, I just go there. You know, even when we come to the meeting outside there, we're discussing and we're talking, and we're talking business, and we're talking some, uh, you know, some funny things. And then when the time comes, I say, oh, it's my time now, I need to get there now. Then I come there now, and I do blah 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 and everything, and because I know the technique and i know what to say and then i know the right thing to say and everybody is all right you judge yourself no that's not right serving the lord like that your heart is not there your mind is not there your concentration is not there your will is not there you're not consecrating everything to the lord you're not laying everything on the altar you can't do that that's why it says if we will judge ourselves then on the final day we will not be judged Give me a good amen. amen. But look at the other side of the coin. I'm looking at First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 24. First Timothy chapter 5. We're looking at verse 24. Are you there now? I said, have you opened the Bible? Or you're just looking at my face? Look at your Bible. First Timothy, what's the chapter? What's the verse? Okay, you are going to read it now. One, two, three, go. You know what that is saying? It says, some men's sins are open beforehand. We preach the word of God. It strikes us. It convicts us. It kind of, it pains us. And then we stand up or we kneel down. Or maybe if you're in your house, you're almost rolling on the ground and you're crying to the Lord. And if you want, if you need to make restitution to say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have been doing this in this way. It's open beforehand. And sometimes you're rebuked. How could you have done that? You're telling me that's what you did. You're telling me that's the way you went. You're telling me that's what you as a minister of god how could you do that but everything now is open and your conscience is clear because now it's open beforehand it has gone before to judgment and it will not be reckoned against you anymore in jesus name but it says in verse 24 some men 
they follow after. Their sins are following them like the shadow. They will not confess. They will not repent. They will not get rid of it. It's telling them in their conscience, look at this sin that you have done. Look at this sin you are doing. And look at the way you are living. Judgment day is coming. Judgment day is coming. I cannot face the music. I cannot face the consequence. I cannot face, I cannot make it open. How can I go and tell my group pastor? How can I go and tell my women leader? How can I tell my so and so? How can I tell my pastor, my GS, that this happened, that this happened, and then you hold that on until you die with that guilt and condemnation. So men, they follow after. Now you come to the day of judgment, and lo, all those things you couldn't make open, all those things you couldn't settle, everything comes before you now, and you think the Lord will not require it. He'll require it because it says very clearly here, you should have judged that thing, judge yourself, and repent of that and turn from that, and now come over and live a new, and live a new life, and live the life of a real child of God, transparent without anything to hide transparent without anything to be uh, afraid about transparent and you're doing the work of god now your heart is there your mind is there and there's nothing that brings condemnation i pray it will happen like that and then when you go to the great beyond everything has now been settled and because it's settled you're all right but if you don't settle it and you're going about you're trying to manage up and patch up with the work of god i'm doing this i'm doing this i'm doing that and that guilt is inside there on the day of judgment the lord will bring the secrets out and it's not going to be funny at all when you come because it's not going to be a small congregation like this all the angels will be there before god before christ before the angels the elect angels and all the saints and everybody all everybody will be there and then they'll bring you out it's like what you used to do i don't know whether they're still doing that now in schools you know after we're taking the exam then they call our parents they call friends they call everybody all of them will be there then they begin to call out the results one by one and then the last one, the one that you will not, uh, you know, was not measuring up at all, is uh, brought there, and then he's told that he failed before everybody, and the shame that will come. Think about that. Just his, that's just his school, but now on the final day, with a great assembly of uncountable people, and then somebody is singled out and is saying, uh, "You are making a noise on the pulpit. You are not faithful. You are preaching holiness, but you are not holy. You are preaching sanctification, but you are not sanctified. You are preaching." this but you are not really living it and everybody will hear I pray it will not happen to you but you know when you settled everything and then that judgment you come like Enoch and you've been walking with God and eternally and outwardly in your family in the secret in the private in the public by the grace of God you're living by grace it will be a wonderful day for us on that day we're coming to point number three now the challenge of fully following the incorruptible just one now let's talk about the just one the one that is referred to as the just one we're looking at uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. I want to identify first the just one. Acts chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 14. It says, but she denied the Holy One, the just and desired a mortar to be granted unto you. You denied the Holy One, the just. Who is the just there? Say so your voice is weak. It's chapter 7, verse 52. Chapter 7, verse 52. It says in verse 52, Which of the prophets have ye not, have, have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one. Who is the just one there? Jesus Christ. Chapter 22, verse 14. Acts chapter 22. We're reading from verse 14. Acts chapter 22, verse 14. It says in verse 14, and it said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one. Who is the just one? Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. We're reading from verse 18. First Peter chapter 3. 
reading from verse 18 it says in verse 18 it says for christ also as one suffered for sins the just for the unjust who is the just jesus christ and now we're talking about the challenge of fully following the incorruptible just one we're called to be like christ we're called to be conformed unto christ christ our savior is our master is our lord is the just one he pleased the father in ministry he pleased the father in all things and we are called to be conformed unto him called to be conformed unto him romans chapter 8 verse 29 romans chapter 8 reading from verse 29 for whom he did for no he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He has called us to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And look at uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Philippians chapter 2. Reading from verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. He wants us to be conformed unto Christ. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He wants us to be totally conformed unto Christ. Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Total conformity, full conformity unto Christ the incorruptible just one first peter chapter 2 verse 21 for even here unto were ye called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example leaving us an example leaving us an example then it goes on to say that ye should follow his steps i will follow i said i will follow and the strength of the Lord will abide with you to follow through in Jesus' name. Now, let's come back to Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 4. And we're reading now from verse 2. Here is the charge we have been given. And the charge we have been given, the Lord Jesus Christ has gone before us. And he's done it so well. And he says we are to be conformed unto him. Look at this, reading from verse 2. Preach the word. That's what Jesus did. Be instant in season and out of season. That's what Jesus did. Reprove and rebuke. That's what Jesus did. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Jesus did exactly that for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine even at the time in which he lived the Pharisees will not endure sound doctrine the Sadducees will not endure sound doctrine but he still stood on the word of God and he preached the word of God fearlessly and faithfully but after their own laws shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears false prophets were there at that time that tried to contradict Jesus Christ but he still kept to the world and it shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be touched unto fables there were people that did that at the time of Jesus but he just kept on teaching the word of God watch thou in all things endure affliction that's exactly what Jesus did do the work of an evangelist that's what he did and make full proof of that ministry that's exactly what he did and what the Lord is calling us to do is look I've done that before you and because I did that before you i'm able to give you the grace to do that as well because i called you to be conformed unto me let's look at them briefly it says number one look at chapter chapter four verse two tell me the three words there the three words there chapter four verse two uh, there, there you're coming up i love that say that again 
preached the word. You know what Jesus did? He preached the word. He preached the word in the house. He preached the word at the seaside. He preached the word on the mountainside. He preached the word to the multitude. He preached the word to the individuals. He preached the word from city to city. Preach the word. And the Lord Jesus is saying, I've left the example for you. Do as I've done and preach the word. We're looking at Mark chapter 2 verse 2. Mark chapter 2 verse 2. And straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room for to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. He preached the word unto them. It's not telling us to do something he has not done. He's done it already. And he did it faithfully. And he did it effectively. And we are to do the same thing as well. Mark chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 38. Mark chapter 1. We're reading from verse 38. In verse 38 it says, And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. He didn't just stay in one place. If they want to hear, let them come to me. I have the truth, I have the word, and I have the gospel, I have the salvation. If they want to hear, they want to see the light, I'm the light of the world, let them come. No, he went to them, he went everywhere. That's why the early church, all those disciples, they did what Jesus Christ did. We're looking at the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8 and verse 4. Chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad, what did they do? They went everywhere. What were they doing everywhere? What are we going to be doing everywhere? Preaching the word. Christ did it and we're doing it. We're coming to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Instant in season and out of season. What that is saying is there'll be times it's not easy. There'll be times it's not convenient. There's, there'll be time, there'll be difficulties and challenges. But even with those difficulties, Jesus still did it and he said, Go and do it. We're looking at John chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 6. John John chapter 4, reading from verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus at on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. He was weary. He was thirsty. He was hungry. And his disciples went to buy bread. But all the same, look at what happened. Look at verse 10. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who is who it is that says unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee the living water. Was preaching to that woman, even though she was weary, even though he was tired, even though he was hungry, and then he gave the explanation. Look at verse 33. Therefore said the disciples one to another, As any man brought him ought to eat, and Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that that sent me and to do what to finish his work even in weariness he will not give up even in tiredness he will not give up and the lord is telling us preach the word be instant in season and out of season and then in the second timothy chapter 4 and i'm reading from verse 2 here reprove and rebuke reprove and rebuke reprove and rebuke exactly what jesus christ did he reproved when they didn't do the right thing he rebuked them when they didn't do the right thing. Mark chapter 8, we're looking at verse 33. Mark chapter 8, and we're reading from verse 33. We're told here in verse 33, but when the, he turned about, he looked on his disciples and he, what did he do? He rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things uh, that be of men. You see what Jesus did? When Peter was to be rebuked, he rebuked him. And when John and James, James and John, were to be rebuked, he rebuked them. Why? Because, because he was a following after this, even though that had not been eaten, he was leaving the example for us. And in your church, in your local church, in your group church, in your, in your region, in your area, somebody has done something wrong. Ah, we cannot talk about that. We cannot talk them because, you know, they react 
And the way you respond, you'll be sorry for yourself. You rebuked anybody. You'll be sorry for yourself. You wanted them to get to heaven. You'll be sorry for yourself. You wanted them to be holy and righteous. So don't go that direction. You preach the word. So if they don't accept, that's between them and God. If they don't uh, shape up, that's between them and God. Jesus will not do that. He rebuked Peter when Peter needed rebuke and really needed correction. Look at Luke chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 54 Luke chapter 9 will follow Jesus I will follow Jesus somebody there said I will follow Jesus do you know mothers who cannot rebuke their daughters do you know fathers who cannot rebuke their sons do you know pastors who cannot rebuke anybody in the church whatever they do the going of the broad way that leads to perdition and hell uh -uh, i cannot talk he doesn't want to suffer for their salvation he doesn't want to suffer for them being holy but if you're going to follow jesus reprove and rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine it tells us in luke chapter 9 verse 54 and when his disciples james and john saw this they said lord will thou that will command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as elias did and he turned and what did he do he rebuked them say and said ye know not what manner of spirits ye are of and now that's what the lord is telling us in first timothy chapter 5 verse 20 first timothy chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 20 first timothy chapter 5 here we're reading from verse 20 it says in verse 20 them that sin what do we do are you still there? Yeah. Them that sin, what do we do? Rebuke them all. You know, I've heard of some, you know, people. In fact, some, sometimes they did themselves. Uh, they, they tell me, and, and they think they're doing the right thing. You know, they say, uh, you know, sir, uh, one of our workers, one of our leaders, one of our preachers actually went into adultery. And I interviewed him, and he accepted that he's done something like that. And Lord, we're waiting for you. We're not being able to see you. It's taking about uh, three months now the man is still preaching is still doing whatever because we are waiting for the gs that the gs will say okay stop him you are not waiting for me you are afraid you don't want to take responsibility you don't want to say uh, that you are to stop and this cannot continue because you're afraid of what the people will do you yourself you're a compromiser you are not obeying the word of god you are not waiting for me you are waiting for yourself until you can sum up courage and do the right thing i pray that you'll do the right thing in jesus name look at that again them that sing timothy don't wait for me and say paul the apostle is the gs the general superintendent and when he comes i will tell him he says no that's why you are there in ephesus that's why you are in that region in that locality or in that state it says them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear and this one is not a private counsel i charge thee before god and the lord jesus christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one to another doing nothing by partiality the lord will give you the courage he'll give you the stamina he'll give you the backbone and you will do it in jesus name second timothy chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 2 here it says exhort without long suffering and doctrine without long suffering and doctrine that's exactly what jesus did and when he had spoken and he outlined the doctrines they said he spoke with authority and not like the scribes and the pharisees we're coming to chapter 4 verse 3 it says for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but you know jesus christ even though they will not endure even though they didn't show that they understood he still said what needed to be said john chapter 3 john chapter 3 reading from verse 3 jesus answered and said unto him verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god did nicodemus understand no 
Did, could you must say unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Nicodemus, tell me what follows there. You must be born again. You see, Jesus Christ was not looking at their faces before he told them the truth. Is the truth personified himself. And then, even though the heap of teachers among themselves, false teachers and false prophets, deceiving them, Jesus still emphasized the truth. Look at the testimony concerning Jesus, Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, reading from verse 16. Matthew chapter 22, verse 16. And they sent out unto him the disciples with their audience, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth, neither carest thou for any man. What a testimony. That's the testimony the Lord uh, shall make a people to bear concerning us. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of Man, I pray you'll be bold, you'll be courageous, and you teach the truth of the word of God without um, kind of without shaking, without wavering in Jesus' name. We're coming back to Second Timothy chapter four, and I'm reading now from verse uh, from verse four. They will turn their ears away; they will turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. But Jesus Christ kept on emphasizing the truth; he shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And tonight, you know the truth. And the truth has made you free. Free to preach the word of God. And free to stand everywhere the Lord calls you to minister in Jesus' name. Now, but watch in all things endure affliction. Watch in all things endure affliction. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 2. Here is about Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured, he watched, he endured, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him for consider him uh, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself look at uh, second Timothy chapter 4 verse 5 but watch thou in all things and do affliction do the work of an evangelist did Jesus do the work of an evangelist I said did Jesus do the work of an evangelist look at Luke chapter 19 verse 10 Luke chapter 19 verse 10 for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost he committed his very life everything that he had he committed into it and it says now make full proof of thy ministry make full proof of thy ministry the father testified of him he had approved himself before the father before his disciples and before the angels of God and before even the Pharisees before everybody and he said look this man doeth many miracles if we don't do anything about him the Romans will come and take our land he was he, he made a proof of his ministry abundantly we're looking at a John chapter 4 and we'll start here for John chapter 4 Verse 34, Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. You'll be like Jesus. I said you'll be like Jesus. You will do this work. You address yourself to this work. In chapter 9, chapter 9, reading from verse 4, I must walk the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can walk. He addressed himself to the work. He never took vacation. He just walked and walked and walked until he finished. Chapter 17, verse 4. Chapter 17, verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. 
and the Lord is now calling you. He says, I've done the work, I've done my part, and I've gone through all that, preaching the word, instant in season, and out of season, reprove and rebuke, without long suffering, inner and doctrine, even though the time has come, that men shall not endure some doctrine, but you heap to themselves, teachers, have been itching ears, you are to endure affliction, and do the work of an evangelist until you finish, and you are going to make full proof of your ministry. The Lord will help you. His grace will be sufficient for you. The Spirit of God will be poured abundantly upon your life. You cannot fail. You will not fail. This is your hour. This is your time. He has called us to do something and he's charged us before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ and we're going to do it. If you're weak, you'll become strong today. If you are being lax and idle and you know being lazy, but today you're going to come out with new consecration and new courage and this work will prosper in your hand. I can see you now on that final day when the judgment day shall come. And then you walk before the Lord and the Lord said he is, he, that's the faithful one coming. That, that's the fruitful one coming. And then he says, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in that ministry. Have rule over five cities, over this and over that. And great will be your joy. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord today. Let's get ready. Let's get ready. Judge yourself. Evaluate yourself. Examine yourself. How have I been doing the work of the Lord? And what new strength am I to bring in today? The Lord will help you. The Lord is waiting to help you. He'll help you.